Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A few weeks ago, I did a video on avalanches on Mars, and I mentioned the location of these giant cliff faces as, you know, 83 degrees north, 120 degrees west, roughly, or in this case, 235 degrees east. Some of you actually asked me, how do astronomers define the coordinate systems for planets? Where is the meridian drawn? Now, on Earth, zero degrees meridian runs through the Greenwich Observatory, and that was defined, well, that was set up, that particular meridian was set up by a guy called George Airy, and the reason that we use it on Earth is largely down to the fact that Britain in the 19th century was pretty powerful and had a very large navy and the people that were really concerned about longitude were the you know, captains of ships. That's kind of why Britons uh, became the, z the zero meridian. Now in the case of Mars, the zero meridian was defined by a feature that was observed by the early Martian observers. They were able to see a bright spot and track it as it moved over the disk. And that became the spot that they would use for their uh, coordinates. Now, as spacecraft went in and got better and better pictures, it became possible to actually see what these features were. And so they found a crater. And they said, that is going to be the crater which will define the zero meridian. And there it is. If I put my cursor here in the bottom left, you can see that that is pretty close to being zero degrees. But then they went in and got even better pictures. So they decided instead of using this big crater, which is pretty wide, they would use a tiny crater inside it called Airy Zero. Again, these are obviously named for George Airy. That's all well and good, but these craters are kind of large and they move a little. So the actual coordinate system isn't defined by this anymore. It's actually defined by the landing location of Viking 1. Now, Viking 1 isn't at the zero. It's at, it's defined to be, uh, you know, 47.95 degrees west. There it is over here. So because the lander is a small thing and because the position is well known, that's the reference point at which the entire coordinate system is based. Now, this is a problem that has to be addressed for every single body that we discover. And there's a group within the IAU that's kind of, that's one of their specialties, is deciding what the coordinate system should be, where the meridian should be joined. And sometimes it's very easy to pick the meridian and pick the poles. For example, almost every moon is tidally locked to its parent body. If you go out and look at the moon, it's always got the same side facing towards the Earth. Now, it's not to say that it's perfectly lined up in the same place all the time, because the moon does wobble back and forth. This is an example of the lunar libration. And, you know, as well as it rotating, the rotation is just because of the viewpoint on the Earth. But if you look, the center point of that moves back and forth as the moon's orbit is slightly eccentric. And the rotation or the speed of rotation around the Earth isn't constant all the time. So what to figure out where the meridian is, you pick the average point, the average uh, point that lines up with the other body. And that after great debate becomes your zero point of your system. With rotation, it's quite easy as well. You pick the pole that points above the plane of the solar system. And that's the invariable plane based upon the mass, you know, and angular momentum of the solar system. So using this, they can come up with coordinate systems that work for all the moons. They can work for Io, for Europa, uh, for Callisto, for Ganymede, all of these are tidally locked and therefore they keep their same face towards their parent body. But this of course doesn't work for the planets. Now in the case of Mars, the feature was chosen because it was the first thing that people saw that consistently returned. With Venus on the other hand, what we knew for a long time was clouds. It got to the point where people thought maybe there are dinosaurs and forests under these clouds. Obviously, that didn't happen. But radar was, of course, able to penetrate the cl clouds. And the first observations of Venus were by radio telescopes on Earth. They were able to observe uh, certain reflective regions. These were nicknamed uh, Alpha Regio and Beta Regio. And they basically said that Alpha Regio was going to be the center, the zero meridian. The Russian Venera missions, they went, of course, visited 
uh, Venus and they managed to get to some better terrain maps and in the 1990s of course Magellan went to Venus and got the best maps yet. So uh, Alpha Regio got remapped and it's now defined by a small crater called Ariadne. Now the last of the four inner terrestrial planets is of course Mercury and it's probably the one that's been explored least because it's the hardest to get to. Mariner 10 was the first one to really do a flyby and because of the way that Mar uh, sorry, Mercury orbits and rotates, uh, it, Mer Mariner 10 never really saw the entire planet of Venus. So it was discovered in the 1960s that Mercury rotated three times for every two orbits around the Sun. That is a 3 to 2 resonance. And when Mariner visited it, it visited it uh, two orbits apart and therefore the same side was always facing the Sun. Of course, at that point, astronomers had decided where they thought the zero meridian should be for mapping purposes. Unfortunately, when Mariner got there, that meridian was in darkness. So they couldn't actually photograph what they thought their zero point should be. So instead, they picked another point, 20 degrees east, and they called it Honkal, which is apparently the Mayan word for 20. In the 21st century, NASA, of course, got Mer uh, Messenger into orbit around Mercury, and we started to get much better maps. Although, of course, one hemisphere was much better mapped than, uh, than the other because the space probe came down low over one pole but couldn't get close on the other one, basically because it didn't have enough delta V to get into a low enough orbit to do good mapping. We are going to get good mapping of Mercury with the Bepi Colombo mission, but that, of course, is going to take a while to get there. Now, getting a bunch of scientists to agree to a coordinate system for a terrestrial planet is, you know, no doubt requires a bit of consultation and agreement, but the planet sometimes doesn't even agree as to what the rotation and coordinate system should be. The gas giants in particular have differential rotation across different latitudes. This is a great movie from the Voyager approaches to Jupiter, and you can see that the central, the equatorial regions are rotating much faster than the polar regions. This is true for all the four gas giants, and the general agreement is that the rotation should actually be defined by something like the magnetic field. But even then, there are people within the communities that argue over whether the magnetic field really represents the rotation of the planet and everything else. But I, I, I will leave those people to their discussions. And since we're talking about astronomical disagreements, the, the IAU working group also has to cover all the bodies in the solar system and they have to come up with consistent rules. So Pluto, of course, most intelligent people agree that it is a dwarf planet. But because it changed state from being a full-blown planet to being a dwarf planet, it's had an interesting side effect. Apparently, according to the rules, planets are allowed to rotate in the opposite direction, so Venus has a negative rotation. But with smaller bodies, they or they rotate accord they always rotate in the same direction, even if their axes, the rotational axes, are pointing down. So when Pluto switched from being a regular planet to being a dwarf planet. That meant that the sense of its rotation actually flipped upside down. But of course, at that point, New Horizon hadn't mapped it properly. Of course, with Pluto, it's in a binary system with Charon, and the meridian will be the points on the planet and its moon, which face its nearest neighbor. That's a good reference point for the system. So once you've agreed to those rules, you have a nice, easy set of coordinates that map, again, have a one-to-one -one mapping of latitude and longitude to planetary locations, but that doesn't work for everybody. And in particular, the next object the New Horizons looked like doesn't work this way. Good old-fashioned latitude and longitude would actually result in multiple points matching the same latitude and longitude. So what do you do? Well, one way possible way is to agree on separate latitude and longitude coordinates for each body. But then, of course, you have weird things again where it could be in one body or the other. And that's even before you consider the fact that it might be more like a pair of pancakes joined together rather than, say, a pair of giant snowballs. So I think it's fascinating that there is a group that's more or less dedicated to this, to making sure that astronomers can all agree where on the surface of a body an object is and trying to get a consensus for everything and a set of rules 
that makes sense for everyone. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.